Did everybody enjoy the 4th of July? Everybody have a good 4th of July? All right. Did anybody, I'm just curious, did anybody shoot off fireworks? Let me see your hand. All right. You showed some of you dangerous people. All right. Now I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, man. Come on. Somebody know this. You know, I love North Carolina. I was North Carolina born and bred. North Carolina fireworks are absolutely lame. Can I get an amen? They are, I don't know who came up with those laws. I don't, I don't know. But if you want real fireworks, man, you got to go over the border. Now I know there's a place right over the border in South Carolina called South of the Border. And you'll see all of those signs from like, you know, 200 miles out. When you go to South of the Border during the year, there's nobody there. And I can't, I can't figure out how in the world they stay in the business. Now I know how they stay in the business. One day of the year when everybody goes to South of the Border and get good fireworks. My next door neighbor, probably probably spent $3,000 south of the border. I didn't need to go to Hope Mills, man. I mean, they were just popping them off, man. North Carolina fireworks just pop. Uh, south Carolina fireworks go boom, and I love it, you know. Uh, north Carolina fireworks, you might burn your finger, you know, lighten a little sparkler, you know. Uh, south Carolina fireworks, man, I love them. Uh, you could blow off your hand, but if you don't get out of the way, and then, you know, it's good. Rachel and I, my, my youngest daughter, uh, several years ago, it's been a long time ago, she, she loved fireworks, and we went across south of the border, and, uh, and we bought illegal fireworks. Just deal with it. <laughs> Save your emails. I, I know. Anyway, we bought illegal fireworks, and 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 we bought bottle rockets, man. You, anybody know what about you know? And these are North, these are South Carolina bottle rockets, all right. And, and so you put them in a bottle, man. They go up about a hundred feet in the air, and they boom, and it was awesome. And uh, and so I, I, I lit one, and and I wouldn't let her light them, and I, and I lit it, and I stood back. When I did, I tipped the bottle over, and the bottle fell in the street, we were in the street and the bottle rocket went out of the bottle and made a beeline right under a car about four houses down. <laughs> I mean, right under that car and stayed there. <laughs> and we were like a deer in a headlight. I said, Rachel, she said, daddy, is it gonna? I said, yeah, I think it is. And it went boom. And um, I said, we gotta go inside maybe. I mean, you know, so. <laughs> I. Man, if that car had had a gas leak or something, I mean, that car would have gone, it would have been awesome. But anyway, so, uh, so anyway, so I love, I, you know, so I love, I love, I, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't know what you think about when you think about the 4th of July. I know 4th of July was last week and, uh, and we were finished up a series at the movies, which is a really great series. But I, but I, I wanted to, I wanted just to address uh, something about 4th of July uh, because I think, I think it's good. Uh, for us every now and then to go back and, and realize where we came from and, and what God has done. Nobody, nobody says a perfect nation. We have things in our past in our nation I'm ashamed of. And, and I'd like to think I wouldn't have been part of it back then. But then again, uh, I mean, you, know, you never know what the national conscience is. I'm sure 100 years from now, we're all participating in something that 100 years from now, that those people that would look back on us and say, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they participated in that. And I get that. But I want us to take a look at America, past, present, and future. A very simple message, uh, but I think, it, you know, I think it's good to always uh, go, go, go back to that. Uh, and, and I realize, you know, when we talk about, you know, you talk about all this stuff, uh, you know, that it, especially when you talk about fireworks and all that, maybe some of you parents wouldn't, wouldn't do that. We, we have a different generation now and generations change. Uh, you know, I, I know, uh, you know, so, some of you may, you may, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't dare do fireworks. You know, somebody might get hurt. I mean, you got to wear a helmet for everything. I, I mean, I understand that. I heard, I heard a parent the other day talking to, they were talking to their kid. Don't do that. Don't play with that. You need to put that thing down. That thing poke your eyeball out. And the kid was playing with a beach ball. Come on. I mean, you know, so, and, 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 and so generations change and things change and times change. And I understand that, but I want to go back and look at America past, present, uh, and, and, and future. And so it's a very simple message. Uh, 3,000 years ago, King David, the greatest king Israel ever known, said something that we need to be reminded of. So grab your Bible, take your Bible, turn your Bible on, whatever you got to do to get your Bible. Psalm 127, 1. Psalm 127, 1. Uh, and, and listen to what he said. He said, unless the Lord builds the house, uh, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I mean, what, what David was saying, he said, listen, it doesn't matter if you're building a house, it doesn't matter if you're building a church, it doesn't matter if you're building a city or a country or nation, unless the Lord's in it, 
unless the Lord is the foundation, unless the Lord builds it, you're laboring in vain if you try to do it. And I think we're seeing that day. I, I think we're seeing a lot of that. But to be honest with you, I think our forefathers understood that. And so we're going to look at several things. We're gonna, first of all, we're going to look at America in the past. Years ago, uh, we took a group of students to what we call SLU 201. Uh, we still have students go to SLU 101, whatever. But we took students to 201. Now, when you go to SLU and Student Leadership University, when you go to 201, it, they go to Washington, D.C., and they tour Washington. And, and um, Jay Strack and Richard Land and, and some, of the, some of those really great historians, great Christian brothers, We'll take the students around, and there's hundreds of students, and we'll take around to all the monuments in our country. And I don't know if you'll realize or not, but most of the monuments in our country, they're in Washington, D.C. And by the way, it's free, and I really encourage you. You live this close to Washington. You need to go. It's free. And they go to all of these monuments, and they were mesmerized by all of the biblical quotes on our monuments. And a lot of them were direct quotes from our founding fathers. And student after student in our church came up to me and said, Pastor, we didn't know this. We've never been taught this. We didn't know that George Washington said this. We didn't know that Thomas Jefferson said this. We didn't know that John Adams said this. We didn't know. We haven't been taught. And then it dawned on me of how far we've come with religionless history. People who try to rewrite history. Now, let me, let me tell you something about the danger of that. And the danger of trying to rewrite history is you do understand we have our founding fathers, the writings in their own handwriting. We still have those. You can, you, you can read what, and, and, and if I'm going to write something and a hundred years from now, somebody says, well, that's what they wrote, but that's not what they meant. Then you're just trying to rewrite history for your own agenda. And, and, and so I'm going to be bringing out some things very quickly that some of our students here today, you may not have heard because you've not been taught this. But I'm telling you, everything I'm sharing with you, you can, you can look it up, you can look this up, and I have it in their own handwriting. So we know what they meant, we know what they said, and we know they meant what they said by reading what they said. Now, Professor Fuzzy Face wants you to take them at their word. They don't want you to research this. And so through the years, you've been taught, and we've all been taught some things that, that, are, that are rewritten and so I want us, I want us to kind of look at what the real story is of America in, 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 in the past. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, and you can turn to it just for a moment, Matthew chapter 7, uh, when Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he gave this illustration about somebody building their house on the sand, building their house on the rock. You guys remember that? Remember that? And he said, if you build your house on the sand, the wind and waves come, it's going gonna, it's gonna to crumble. But if you build your house on the rock, then it's going to stand. In other words, the rock, building your house on the rock is a foundation. Now, David said that unless the Lord builds a house, you labor in vain. So, so Jesus is not talking about building, building just your home on the rock. He's talking about building your life on the rock. And he's, we talk about building your nation on the rock. He was talking to his people. He was talking to the Hebrews. But he would also say the same thing for any nation. You've got to build it on the rock. Well, what is the rock? What is that rock? What is that solid foundation? We look at verse 24, Matthew chapter 7, and look at verse 24. He said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. In other words, the rock, the foundation that you got to build on is the word of God. That's the rock. And, that's, and that's, that, that's the only thing that you can build your family on. That's the only thing you can be. Listen, nobody, nobody wants to know your opinion. It's not how you think about it. It's not how I think about it. It's not what Baptists say that makes a difference. It is what the inerrant, infallible word of God. Jesus said, he, whoever does and hears these sayings of mine, that's the word of God and does them. That's the solid foundation that you build on. On May 17th, 1776, Several months before we signed the Declaration of Independence, did you know that Congress, Congress instituted a proclamation for a day of fasting and prayer? Congress did. May 17th, 1776. The whole nation was instituted, a proclamation. Now, by the way, Google it. Go, go to May 17th. Don't do it now while I'm preaching. Come on, come on. Just bear with me for the next you know, 80 minutes. Uh, 
You can Google it. May 17, 17, and, and by the way, there were many proclamations, but on May 17, 17, 17, and you can read the proclamation. Now listen to this. I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. Say amen. Come on. The proclamation of prayer was not an arbitrary prayer. It was not a proclamation to pray to God. It was not a proclamation to pray to Allah. It was not a proclamation to pray to the God you see fit or pray to the God that you're closest to. It was not a proclamation. It was a pro- you can read it. It was a proclamation to pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a proclamation to call upon the name of Jesus. Why? Because what they wanted to know is, Jesus, we need you in this thing. Because you, get re- you remember, on July the 4th, 1776, they were going to sign a Declaration of Independence. And that Declaration of Independence was their death warrant. Every signer of the Declaration of Independence just knew that they were going to... It was treason, by the way. And they knew they were going to be hung. They knew they were going to be shot. They knew they were going to lose their life, more than likely, more than likely. And so months before, they said, let's, let's, let's call upon the name of Jesus for two reasons. Number one, if we're on the right track, if we're doing the right thing, Jesus, we want you to bless us. Not Allah, not the God of your making, not an arbitrary prayer, Jesus. Read it. We want to know if we're on the right track, we've got to have your blessing. And if we're on the wrong track, you stop it. If we're not doing the right thing, you forgive us and give us direction. That was the proclamation of prayer. And nobody cried foul. Nobody said, whoa, 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 time out. Chapel Resident Church of State, you can't do that. Nobody did that. Because the national consciousness at that time is that we need Jesus in this thing. And so you can't rewrite history because you've got to understand that even though all of our forefathers were not Christians, and all of our forefathers did not believe the Bible. They still had a reverence for the Bible. They knew, they understood that the laws of this land had to be steeped in a Judeo-Christian ethic that was founded on the word of God. They knew that. Now, you're not going to hear that in college. You're not going to hear that in high school. Because we have revisionist historians. They want to rewrite all that. And the reason why they want to rewrite it is because our founding fathers, our founding documents are full. Listen to me. Listen to me. They're full of Jesus. Yes. North Carolina, the state that, that you're in, you may not be from here, but bless God, you got here as fast as you could. Can you get an amen? Amen. <laughs> the Constitution of North Carolina reads, and I quote, to the glory of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all through our history. And revisionists say, no, 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 we, gotta, we, we, we can't have that. We can't have that. Did you know this? Listen, George Washington. When George Washington was inaugurated president, he added, he himself added, it was not in the original oath of office. But when George Washington finally took office, he added four words at the end of the oath on his own. And it was the words, so help me God so help me God and you know what he did now you you young people you, you're not you're not getting this in school and if you're in college you're not getting this in college you're not going to get this in East Carolina you're not you're not going to get this at Chapel Hill you're not even going to get this at Pembroke but you know what George Washington did no, no and this is true after he said so help me God he took his Bible he had his hand on his Bible when he took the oath of office which they still do and he took his Bible and he laid it on the ground and he got on his knees and he kissed his Bible. It was symbolic. He was saying that if you are privileged enough to hold the highest office in this land, you cannot do it unless you are in the authority of God and his word. That's what he was saying. That's what he was saying. John Adams, our second president, said this, and I quote, direct quote, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate its conduct by its precepts. What a paradise that region would be. In 1861, Abraham Lincoln held up his Bible. Nobody cried foul. Nobody said, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't do that. Nobody told Lincoln you can't do it. 
Abraham Lincoln held up his Bible in 1861, and he said, and I quote, in regard to this great book, I have to say that it is the best gift that God ever gave to man. All the good that the Savior has done for us has been communicated to us through this book. But not only that, not only did, and I could give quote after quote after quote, but not only that, not, not only did our founding fathers uphold and revered the word of God, so did our founding higher institutions of higher learning. Did you know that out of the 108 first institutions of higher learning in America, 106 of them were founded on Christian principles and the Bible. And one of the leading ones, believe it or not, was Harvard. Did you know that Harvard was started by a preacher, started by a preacher for preachers? As a matter of fact, on the original seal of Harvard, I'm talking about Harvard now. And you, 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 could, get, you could get all the believers in Harvard in a phone booth. Okay, I got a, a phone booth. We used, we used to have these, anyway. All right, so... You can get all the believers in Harvard in a Volkswagen, all right? Let, let me put it that way. But did you know on the original seal of Harvard, and by the way, if you go to, if you go to campus on Harvard, you can find some, some, still there are some that are etched in the walls and etched in some of those ivory-colored brick, the original seal. They're, they're hard to find, but it's there. But the original seal of Harvard said this, Truth for Christ and the church. That's the original seal of Harvard. It's in Latin, but the interpretation, literally, it's truth for Christ and the church. Harvard was founded on that. Back in 1831, they changed that to just truth. If you look at the official seal of Harvard, it has veritas. That's the Latin for truth. But the bottom line is, whose truth are we talking about? Well, it's anybody's truth. Your truth, my truth, everybody's truth is rest, relevant truth. But in the early days, they understood, no, no, no. Only in Jesus can you really know the truth. And only in Jesus can truth set you free. And only in Jesus can you really have true knowledge. They understood that. That's Harvard. And so you would have to totally rewrite history to take all of the biblical references out. And all of, the, of our founding fathers and our founding institutions you would have to do that. Now, that's, uh, that's America in the, in the past. Now, let me give America in the present. Everybody take your Bible. Turn with me. Here's a, here, here, King David, 3,000 years ago, said something else is vital. Uh, turn to Psalm 3312. And you just saw it on the clip. Psalm 3312. Here's America in the present. Uh, David said, he said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Come on, come on, come on. I, I, I know who I got here. I, I know where we're from. But does is, is anybody here believe that America has been blessed by God? Let me hear a hand clap of praise today. All right, amen. Aren't you glad? You know, you know, you know what I love about this church? Uh, you know, you, you go, I, I preach a lot of revivals, or I used to, and people don't have revivals anymore, but, but, but I, I would go to these churches, man, and, and, and the vast majority of their members have never even been out of the county. And so when we start talking about world events and all that, they look like you like a deer in the, in the headlights. They've never been out of their county. They're born in that county. They live in that county. They're going to die in that county. But when you come to Fayetteville, when you come, and that's what I love about Fayetteville. You can run Fayetteville down all you want to. People call it Fayetteville, Vietnam. Get over that, man. This is a wonderful, wonderful place for the glory of God. I love Fayetteville. I mean, now, obviously, God has to call you to Fayetteville or you ain't going to come. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, I tell everybody, I pastor a church where everybody's there because they were ordered to be there. But anyway, that's okay. But what I love about our church is that so many of you have been all over the world. You've been all over the world. And in my life, I've been privileged by God to be so many different parts of the world for so many places. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to make a statement and go ahead. You can email me. You want to, you can go, I know people are watching online and I get feedback on this. I get because a lot of people don't feel this way. This is just the way I feel. This is my opinion right now. I'm not bringing this out of the Bible. 
But because we, I've been all over the world, because so many, so many of you have been all over the world, I think many of you are going to agree with this. I'm telling you, when you go all over the world and you see how the other half lives, I'm telling you, America on its worst day is still better than most countries at their best. And all God's people say that? Well, I, that was good. Even though that's not biblical, that was still good preaching. Amen. America at its worst is still better than most countries at their best. Back in 1986, and I, I shared a little bit of this last week, Phyllis and I had an opportunity to go to, uh, to communist Poland. This is when it was still communist. The, the, the Berlin Wall had not come down yet. Communism had not stopped yet. Uh, we, we did end up for about four hours in a Czechoslovakia in jail. And, uh, and we got out. Now, I, that's another story altogether. I just want to let you know that, that, that I know what it's like to be in jail. But anyway, so... Uh, but we were in communist Poland. And, uh, and, and my wife got a little homesick. And she, she asked our interpreter, she said, listen, is there any place that we can... And we were right outside of Warsaw, which is a major city. And she said, is there any place that we can probably get a souvenir for our kids? Because our kids were back in the States. And she was missing them. They were so small. And she was really missing. She was really getting homesick. Uh, and so our interpreter said, well, yeah, we have a toy store. Let's go. We went to this toy store. So we were all excited. You know, we're going to buy them something from Poland. You know, we're going to, you know. And we went to the communist toy store. Now, for all of you that have been told communism is the way to go, because everybody is the same. Everybody gets treated the same. And that's, and that we got so many people in our nation. They think that's the way to go. Everybody, everybody's treated fair. Nobody has more than the others. And that's true in a communist country. What they don't tell you is everybody's the same. And what's the same? Nobody has anything. They have nothing. I only saw about four cars and they all belong to the government. Back in those days, Jimmy Swaggart was saying, send me money because we're now in communist country. Send us money. We're on TV in the communist country. We're the thousands of people in the communist country. I was there for a month. I never saw a TV. And I was in people's homes. I was in their apartments. That's where the underground church met. I was in apartment after apartment after apartment. I never once saw a TV. Nobody has nothing. Oh, everybody's the same, but nobody has nothing. So we went to the toy store. You know what was in the toy store? I kid you not. If I'm lying, I'm dying. There was a top, one of those that you press down and you spin it. Anybody remember those? It, you probably don't remember it because it wasn't electronic. <laughs> Had to do it with your own hand. There was a, che a, a, a checker set and a slinky. That was it. That was it. I'm not kidding. I mean, there were like three or four of them, but that, that was your choice. How many of you, how many of you, come on, come on. How many of you know, how many of you are thankful for all the choices that we have in America? Nobody has the choices that we have like in America, amen? amen. Nobody knows that we had, listen, we had a good friend of ours whose brother was in East Germany before the wall came down. And, 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 and she escaped, he was left behind. They never had contact with each other. She didn't know if he was dead or alive. And when the, when the Berlin Wall came down, she, she, she got in touch with him. She got permission because he was very old at this time to send to him so he could come and visit her in America, right here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And he did. And she said, Pastor, I, it never dawned on me. She said, when he got off the airplane, we had to pick up some groceries. She said, I took him to Kroger and he broke down and cried like a baby. He could not believe. The choices that we have in America. I like, I like what Yakov Smirnov, the uh, Russian comedian, said. Uh, uh, he said. He said when he came over to America, he couldn't believe. He couldn't believe the choices that America has. He said he, 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 went, he went with his interpreter at that time because he couldn't speak English. And, and he looked at the store and he, and he saw baby powder. And he said, I mean, he saw, he saw, uh, uh, he, he saw milk, milk, uh, powdered milk. And, and when he saw powdered milk, he asked, he asked the interpreter, he said, what's powdered milk? And he said, you just add water, you get milk. And then he saw uh, orange juice powder. It was powdered orange juice. He said, is this the same thing? He said, yeah, just add water and you, and you get orange juice. And then he said he saw baby powder. 
And then he said, is this a great country or what? (laughs) The choices that we have. But here's our problem. There is a thing called parallel lines. I don't know if everybody can see this. Uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's called the philosophy of parallel lines. And, and when it comes to the church, there's good news and bad news. The good news is, for the most part, even today, the church is still living at a level slightly above the world, the culture. What I mean by that is our divorce rate is not quite as high. Uh, our teenage pregnancies are not quite as high. And so we're, we're still living at a, at a level, a parallel line level, of slightly above the culture. But here's the bad news. In the last 50 years, as the culture has slipped down, so has the church. And the further the culture goes down, the church is going right along. We've not stayed up here. And we should have. There's no reason for us not to. There, there should be that big a difference. But right now it's just like this. And as the culture goes down, the church has gone down. And we see it this day. We see it. We know it. I was in a conference one time when a man gave a testimony. He was so broken. And he said he used to work for a railroad line in Alabama. And he said one day on the job, he said their, their job was to shut railroad cars, these box cars, shut the doors. And sometimes these doors would get hung up. Sometimes they were rusted. Sometimes they'd give them. And he had to take this, this uh, chain uh, and, 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 and this pulley that cranked. And, you'd, and you had to pull on it, and you'd hook it up to the handle, and you'd pull on it, pull on it, and it would start shut. It would shut the door. And he said one day, he said he, he was working, and, and a couple of trains over, uh, a man was pulling on the chain. It got hung up, and he just kept pulling and kept pulling, and the handle snapped off and hit him right in the chest, and it crushed his chest. He said, everybody ran over. They called 911. He was laying there. He was gasping for breath. And he said, I'll never forget it to the day I die. He said, I've heard so much about Jesus, but I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. Is there anybody here that can tell me how to get to heaven? Because he knew he was going to die. And he said, nobody said anything. And he started weeping. He said, you know what's so sad about that? He said, at that time, I was a believer. He said, but I wasn't living it. He said, I cussed with the best of them. I drank with the best of them. And if I had a step forward and said, yes, I'm a believer. I can tell you all about Jesus. He said, even though I did know about Jesus. He said, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And then he made this statement. I'll never forget it. The day I die, I never made it. He said, I let my life shut my mouth. And I think... That's where we are today. I mean, I love you guys, but we're not invested in inviting in people. We're, we're, we're not going to the highways and byways and compelling them to come in. Well, for the most part in our church, our, our associates are people who they go to church. And, you know, we go from home to work to church. And it could be, and I'm not just talking about Aaron Lake Baptist, I'm talking about the Church of Jesus Christ in America. And it could be that our hypocritical living is causing us to shut our mouth. Anybody in your workplace know that you're a believer? Did you go to church? Did you believe in Jesus? You see, it used to be good for business. It's not anymore. You could lose your job because of it. Or you could definitely not get hired because of it. You can, you can lose your friends because of it. You can lose your family because of it. Many of you have. You've already lost your family because you stand for Jesus. But for the most part, we're letting our hypocritical living shut our mouth. We're not standing up for Jesus as we all. You know it and I know it. 
And when I say we, I mean me. I mean all of us. Because it gets, it gets weary to always swim up against the current. It gets weary of having to fight the tide. It's just easier to go along to get along. And it's hard. Especially when people think you're crazy and you're a kook and you're an idiot. And they call you that. It's very hard. But that's where we're at. We're in need of revival, and all God's people said. We know it. You know it. I know it. We do. We're going down as a culture goes down. That's, that's where we are in America. By the way, I got to go. Uh, this, this coming fall, I, I want to do something about that. If nothing else but for one Sunday. And it's coming, so I just want you to get ready for it. We're going to have an old-fashioned invite-a-friend day. And I don't mean a friend that goes to somebody else's church. Listen, I am tired of reaching Baptist. Can I get an amen? I want to reach sinners who know they're sinners. Can I get an amen on that? And so I'm not going to ask you to invite somebody to go to somebody else's church. They're in. Glory to God. Thank you for that. I'm asking you to invest and invite somebody that got nothing to do with church. They got nothing that, that ha, absolutely. And I'm going to preach an evangelistic sermon that day. I'm just going to tell them about Jesus. And we're going to give an old fashioned altar call. And we're going to do the Billy Graham thing. Whatever, whatever God takes. But, but I, it's coming. And I want you even now to start praying about who you can invest and who you can invite on that day. Because we need it. Now, so that brings us to the next point. Well, what about America's future? Well, nobody knows what the future holds. We know that. Nobody can predict the future. You don't know what's going to happen a minute from now. Things happen so fast. I heard, heard about these three people, and this is years ago, and they were on a train, and, and, they, and, and one was a commanding officer, one was a private, and one was a pretty young girl. And they go into this long tunnel, and it's pitch dark in there. And while they're in the middle of that tunnel, they hear a kiss and a slap. When they get out of the tunnel, the commanding officer's face is swollen and red. And he thinks to himself, I think I know what happened. That private went to kiss that girl. She went to slap him. And because it was dark, she missed, and she slapped me. And the girl thought, I know what happened. The commanding officer went to kiss me. It was dark. He didn't kiss me. He kissed the private, and the private slapped him. And the private thought, in America, great. Where else but in America can I kiss the back of my hand, slap my commanding officer, and get away with it? I mean, yeah, that's so that cool. That's got nothing to do with nothing. <laughs> Except to say, things happen fast. Things happen fast. So where's America in our, in our future? Uh, listen, listen, listen to what Paul said. Now, if the word of God had, had such a place in our strong past, and if the lack of the word of God is having such a place in our failing present, then... It stands to reason that the Word of God and our stand for the Bible and our teaching the Bible and our singing the Bible and our preaching the Bible in this place, which I, I'm committed that we always will. I thank God for this church. You, did you know, Air Lake Baptist Church got a long way from being perfect. You, you know that. But I'll tell you, do you know in the 29 years I've been here as pastor, not one time has this church ever turned up their nose to do anything that people could not come to Jesus. And I think we all give God a great big hand clap of praise for that. Amen. That's right. We preach the Bible here. We teach the Bible here. We sing the Bible here. It's imperative that we do. Listen to what Paul said, Philippians chapter 2, 15 and 16. I'm just going to read it real quick. Because, and, and keep in mind where he's writing this. In Philippians 2, 15 and 16, he said, that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst. Listen to this, in the midst. Everybody say the midst. midst. Of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. 
holding fast. Now, how do you do that? How do you be a shite in a, in a dark world? Holding fast the word of life. He's writing this, by the way, in jail. And he's writing this under the emperor of Nero, the Roman emperor Nero. And you know, if you know anything about Nero, Nero killed Christians for sport. He was pagan. He was horrible. He's the one that threw the Christians through the lines. Josephus tells us that Nero would dip Christians in oil alive and set them afire and put them on poles so he could light up his gardens. That's the kind of guy, that's the kind of generation that Paul is living in. And he's in prison. He said, listen, he said, don't give up. Don't give up. The darker the night, the brighter the light. And all God's people said See, this is great days to be an American. This is great days to be a Christian. This is great days to be a believer in America. Don't, don't, listen, just because we're going out, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. We just keep our faith in, in, in the word of God. And I hear people say all the time, well, Pastor, why in the, what's the world coming to? And you see all of the news and all the news seems to be bad. Why in the world is the world coming to? And I got good news for you. I'll tell you what the world's coming to. I know what the world is coming to, and I have no doubt about it. Here's what the world is coming to. The world is coming to one day where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and we're going to be in that day. And all God's people said... We win, ladies and gentlemen, we win. That's what the world's coming to. So listen, listen, don't give up. Don't don't, don't let the culture get to you. Don't let your neighbors get to you. Don't let the media get to you. Be a light in a dark place. By the way, it's easy to do. The darker the night, the brighter the light. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying... There is hope for revival. You can turn these things around. You don't have to give in to what's going on. But listen, here's what I want to leave you with. Don't put your faith and hope in Americans. The greatest American that you could possibly know, listen to me, is the American in the mirror. That's where it starts. Man, we're living in a day where we vote people that are supposed to lead us. And we put our faith and hope that that they're going to lead us well. And they don't. And it doesn't matter what political party you belong to. They just don't. And I'll tell you why they don't. Because our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And, and everybody's heart is the same way. And all God's people said. And, and the bottom line is the only person you can put your faith and hope in His name is not president. His name is not congressman. His name is not senator. His name is not congresswoman and congressman. His name is Jesus Christ. And you know why you can put your faith in up in him? Because he has a perfect heart. Jesus will not fail you. So, America has a great future, but only from the American in the mirror. Are you that one?